Good morning, Irvine. Happy day to everybody. It must be a great day. We get to do physics, right? Every day with physics is a good day. Okay, so on our first lecture, you started uh, being able to, or building on previous skills for making your own measurements and making your own uh, judgments about things and starting to do calculations in your head. So remember, for our quiz on Thursday, there will be no calculators allowed. You're going to have to use your brain for doing all the calculations, and that will make you slow down a lot in those calculations. And it will be, I think at least at the start, frustrating. Okay, so I understand that. You're going to probably feel some frustration from that, but we want to get you practicing where you can do that skill on your own. Uh, so, you know, if you go into uh, a grocery store and you buy something, it's a good thing to kind of check the prices out and then estimate the uh, price per kilogram on the item or the price per gram. Uh, you know, add up, see if you can remember all the prices on things and start to use those calculational skills uh, anywhere you are. For example, as you walk out of the class, you might think, oh no, let's just look down here. I'm strolling back and forth, and <clears throat> I have a speed of about how fast am I going approximately? About one meter per second. My kinetic energy compared to the uh, classroom, a half mv squared. So a v squared, one squared is what? One. one. And my mass is about? 75 kilograms, so we got 75 divided by 2. So I am to have the kinetic energy now of about 37, 40, 40 uh, joule, joules of kinetic energy, right? And then when you get up this morning, uh, say, what, what's, what's your name? Shannon. Shannon, when you get up and walk out of here, you'll probably go up there, right? And so she will have to climb the stairs. Change in potential energy required for that is the work she's going to have to do. M times G times H. 50 kilograms times 9.8, 50 times 10, 500, right? Times how many meters up does she have to go, approximately? We, we, we take our, our meter stick and, and go, okay, one, two, three, maybe four meters, right? Somewhere in that range. Okay, so it would be 4 times 500, about 2,000 joules for Shannon to go up there. Now, if she wanted to, she could go up to the top, roll into a ball, and then come bouncing down the stairs down here, right? So how fast would she be going when she got to the bottom? We would convert the potential energy, that MGH, into a half mv squared. So we're thinking... One half mv squared equals mgh. The masses cancel, right? V squared. Oh, and those equations, then the math starts to come to you, right? Would she be going relatively quickly at the bottom? No. Why? Because she would be in a lot of pain, right? There would have been the frictional losses, the dissipation of the rolling energy coming down here, one bone breaking after another. It takes work to do that, right? Okay, so she would not be rolling at the full speed of a half mv squared equals mgh. She'd be rolling at something less than that. That doesn't mean the energy wasn't conserved. It just meant that some of it went to some other form, a microscopic form. Instead of the macroscopic energy of Shannon rolling down the hill, there is that but not as much as we expected, and part of the other stuff went into microscopic kinetic energy of the molecules, friction and heating and things like that. So we're going to be getting into that. So the idea of the energy conservation still applies, but we're going to find, oh, there's a secret place it goes, microscopic instead of just macroscopic. Okay, so you should be doing all these kind of calculations as you go around. Calculate what your kinetic energy is, okay? Calculate the kinetic energy on when you're driving a car, for example. Okay, so you have all that energy in the car and you have to come to a halt. What do you put your foot on? Either the brakes or the ground, right? To slow yourself down. Which do you prefer? The brakes. Because if you put your foot on the ground, what happens? The car continues moving forward, right? Because it has a lot of 
momentum, right? Something you're going to build in this class, right? So the car has a lot of momentum. You put your foot on the ground, it's going to take a lot of grinding. And unless you're Fred Flintstone, chances are it's going to go through the shoe bottom pretty fast and you're going to be grinding your foot off, okay? Oh, yes, I have seen motorcycle accidents where people have done that. Yes, oh, 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 bad picture. Okay, so <clears throat> now, if we put our foot on the brake, what does it do? It applies the brakes on the wheels. Now, the wheels are not at your foot. At the brake point where your foot hits is a pedal. And that pedal usually is attached behind to a hydraulic system of some kind. There is a pool of fluid sitting behind that pedal, right near it typically. And when you push on that pedal, it pushes a cylinder in that pool of fluid, which then sends the pressure in pipes over to the wheels, to the brake slave cylinders, as they're called, from the master cylinder at the, at the center of the car. That transferal of the pressure is done by using hydraulics. So when we have a push of pressure somewhere, it will be transmitted throughout the liquid to another location. And that's how those brakes work. When they apply the pressure, the, the thing that's spinning near where the brakes are applied is the tire and wheel and a, a brake of some kind, a, a rotor or a brake shoe of some kind is there. And that thing clamps. It's pressed by this hydraulic fluid action. It presses on there and causes friction. So sometimes you can see that at result of that at night on a, a train, for example, if the brakes are working improperly on a subway train or an outdoor train, the brake may hang up and be dragging the whole time. And if you look at it from the outside, you'll see it glowing red. It gets so hot that it glows red and you can see it. Okay, So there's frictional dissipation there. The energy that we have in the car moving forward is being dissipated from macroscopic to friction and the heating microscopic kinetic energy. The thing that I think about when I put the brakes on is not dissipation of energy. I think about dissipation of momentum. Newton's laws are telling us the acceleration. So what we're thinking about in that is the d reduction in momentum that's required. So this is the way you want to think, right? That the force is the time rate of change of momentum. I write a little squiggle underneath the letter to represent vector. Maybe you like to put arrows up above. Maybe you like to write bold-faced to make it a vector. I can't write bold-faced on the board very much. And my personality, I got to be moving all over. I need the, the little squiggles. I like them better. The arrows are too rigid for me, OK? Besides that, how many of you have even held an arrow in your hand? Almost nobody, right? Nobody uses that stuff anymore, right? OK, so anyway, that's the key, that the force we need to apply on the brakes, for me, the real thing that's needed is to change the momentum of the vehicle. And the momentum of the vehicle, then, this is often, right, equal to mass times acceleration. The momentum of the vehicle is what I'm interested in reducing. I'm going to make a change in the momentum. And that's going to be done by applying the brakes, some force acting over time. That doesn't mean that the force is constant in time, but maybe a constant would be a reasonable approximation. When you stomp on the brakes, can you decelerate with a continuous steady force? Yeah, until you come to a halt, OK? And when you step on the accelerator, do you feel a little bit of jerk back in the seat? Because the acceleration was zero before you stepped on it, the acceleration was constant after you stepped on it, 
the change in acceleration is called the jerk. That's the third derivative, right? We have x, we have speed, dx dt, we have acceleration, d squared x dt squared, and we have jerk, d cubed x dt cubed. That word jerk does mean something. You can jerk somebody, right? It means to change the acceleration. So let the words talk to you a little bit. Okay, so we have the hydraulic brakes working by transmitting pressure from one place to another. And does it take the fluid right behind the brake pedal and move it all the way out to the wheel? No, it doesn't. I'm speaking right now, making sound waves. Little compressional waves that wiggle the atmosphere. A few microns. The atoms are so excited to be hearing physics. And you hear those sound waves at you. Does that mean that the molecules that came out of my lungs have made it to you? No, right? And if I drink coffee and have coffee breath in a little while, you're going to be, oh, thank goodness it didn't, right? Okay, so, oh, speaking of which, somebody left a thermos in, in the class last time, someone, and it got turned in. Is it yours? Okay, now this will be very important for demonstration purposes, but not today. Okay? So we'll think about it. What does that thermos do? It keeps things either cold or hot, right? So we want to maintain a temperature difference in the thermos. Or we have such things as these things, right? So if I take the paper off of this, and then you get the hot cup of coffee. I can't do that one. That one's, you've really got that one well, well applied. Okay, if we take, if we take the, uh, if we take the paper off and they hand you the hot tea or hot coffee or whatever it is, tea. that smells like tea. Uh, so if they, isn't it too hot, right? So what they've done is they've manufactured a cup that's about as thin as they can for the structural integrity keep the cost of the overall cup down, and then if you want, you get this guy, which adds a delta x in thickness to there, which allows a little more thermal isolation. And we will make estimates of that, um, oh, in a lecture, maybe two, but probably one. <laughs> okay? Somewhere around there. Okay. <coughs> Let's see now. So, <laughs> making observations. As you go about the rest of your day, I want you observing the world, estimating people's masses now, okay? We know T is 50 kilograms, right? So now we know how to compare and estimate masses of others for that, okay? And we know uh, if we're making our own observations, it tells us, oh, how do we get feedback that we're making our own observations well? Wouldn't you like to get paid for it? Isn't that a good thing? So as you go about your day, if you're making really good observations about nature, most of the time I think you can find more than one penny per day. You should be able to find at least a penny a day. Okay? And so reach over and pick it up. You may think, oh, it's not worth my labor time rate to pick up that penny. Oh, yes, it is, because you're increasing your powers of observation, and you're also checking your powers of observation. Okay? So if you're not finding a penny a day, and you used to, then you go, oh, I may be getting a little old, and polish that power up again. Okay? Where are good places to find pennies? Well, mostly on the ground, right? But, but, but to start, a really good place is the couch, right? Another place is around places that sell things. So you go to those little cafes, the coffee lines, where you got your, or tea lines, whatever you want to call them, those, those places often have lots of money on the ground. Okay, so now you have a, a dilemma. You're in line at Albertsons and you see a penny over there. Do you rush over to pick it up immediately, or do you wait and see if anyone else sees it? 
Learn about other people's powers of observation as well, okay? Oh, yes. All right, the excitement builds. All right. Okay, now, we made observations yesterday morning. For example, we took a plexiglass or some kind of plastic acrylic, I don't know what kind of plastic it was, and we submerged it. And we showed that the volume that was displaced had a buoyant force equal to the water that was displaced because we then poured the water back on top and saw the scale arrived at approximately back to what it had started out from. So there's a buoyant force by displacement of fluid. Another question I might ask about that is, what's the density of the plastic? Oh, do we know the density of the plastic? And you first, remember, what do physicists say most often? I don't know, right? Or if it's early in the morning, I don't know, right? So, so I don't know. Oh, but wait a minute, I dipped it in water. I know that it displaced the water. So it must be denser than water. It didn't float. So I know that the density of the plastic that was used is greater than one gram per cubic centimeter. And on many of these demonstrations, I urge you to come up after the lecture in a couple of minutes there while the classes are changing and try them out for yourself. Come up and measure things a little more. Hold the piece of plastic. Estimate its mass. You may have written down its size. What was its diameter approximately? 15 centimeters, 10 centimeters, somewhere around there, right? And what was its height? Approximately. Five inches, and then you could convert by multiplying by 2.54 and get 12.78 centimeters, right? right? Do you think I got the 0.78 right? You don't know, do you? I don't think so. Uh-uh. Okay, so here, here, here's, the, here's the stumper for the day. You know Pi Day, March 14th? What, what, I wish there was an E Day, but there isn't. Anyway, uh, Pi Day, 314, right? And there's a shirt that's got it printed on it. I think the shirt is wrong. Nobody cares, do they? <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> you've got the volume of the thing. Uh, you, you can uh, estimate the volume. We know the, the density is greater than one gram per cubic centimeter or 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, let's see about adding a little bit to this now. So, so pressure. Okay, here's a person. This is T. Okay, this is a person standing. All right, so actually, how would you draw a person standing? What do they look like? They're kind of like this, right? And then they have feet. So what I'm thinking of is here's a person with an area this is the ground, <clears throat> and this area here, this, these little a's, two times those, is that area. So what I'm doing is simplifying that the area of the person's feet on the ground is that area A. The pressure that they feel, the pressure is going to be the mass of the person divided by the area. It's the weight, the weight that is supported. The supported weight divided by the area of support, right? Which here uh, is the person weight. divided by the foot, the feet, area in our example. And you have no trouble conceiving of that. Okay. And we did an estimate of that 
sitting in the chair had the pressure that you did from sitting in the chair. Now, I just have a thought. Okay, put your hands like this. Now you have, what other weight are you supporting? The atmosphere, right? So all that air, oh, it's a burden, isn't it? All that air up there, okay? Let's see about that. Oh, so, so pressure, here's our person on the ground. Oh, but what about the air? There's a column of air above you, isn't it? All right? And the column of air. There is some weight from the air. Air. And I'm saying that air has weight, and you're going, huh? I'm not used to thinking of that. It just floats by. It's weightless. No, no. Wait just a second, <laughs> right? We have to deal with this. So the air, let's see, if we have a volume of matter, here's some volume, right? The, the mass of the air is going to be rho of the air times the volume, just like we were dealing with for figuring out T's mass. And that air, oh, the reason we don't think or worry too much about air if I pour a cup of air and I hand it to you, you're going to say, oh, that's the mass of the cup. And if I pour a cup of tea and hand it to you, you're going to go, oh, it's the mass of the cup plus the mass of the tea. You notice it, don't you? So we recognize then that the mass density of air, the mass density of air is much less than the mass density of water, and it's about 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter. <clears throat> so, okay, let's think now. Human beings, you need to oxidize what? About 2,000 food calories per day, something like that, which means you got to take in the oxygen to be able to deal with that. So it means you breathe. What do you breathe with? Lungs. So how much air do you pull in per breath? You know that you don't pull in more than the lungs volume, right? And so you start thinking, oh, maybe I breathe the volume of air that's in the lungs. Well, not quite. You need to breathe in enough air that the oxygen that's getting taken in is replaced at a sufficiently fast rate. So you only need to breathe in something like maybe a quarter of a lungful or a fifth or something like that. So if you, here's what I want you to do tonight. Get a dry cleaner's bag, okay? You know, the kind that you can suffocate with. Take the bag and hold it right in front of you and just exhale, not inhale, okay, exhale, and measure the volume. Now remember, science has predictive capability. I'm going to predict that a typical exhale volume is about 200, 300 cubic centimeters, something like that, 200, 300 cubic centimeters, which is about two-thirds of the size of that cup of tea or coffee that you guys have, right? So it's not very much. What's your lung capacity? It's like six or seven times that maybe, right? Something up there, maybe five times that. I don't know. I don't know much biology. 4.6 liters. 4.6 liters, okay. So if we've got, if you're dealing out every breath a few hundred cubic centimeters, you're not dealing out, oh, you're doing only 10%, right? And the stuff keeps mixing around in there. Now, if you go, <sighs> you can exhale or inhale more than that, right? But just find out what your 
normal respiration level is. And then go out and get some exercise. Burn up uh, maybe, uh, you know, 100 or 200 calories at a fairly quick clip. And then do the same breath measurement. See how much you're taking in and out with each breath. I'll bet it's more, right? OK, cool. So we have about 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter sitting above us. And if we have more and more column, so if we have air on top of the person, right? This is the person. Now what's the pressure at the ground? Now the pressure at the ground, P at the ground, is the P from the person's weight plus the P of the air weight. So that one was this uh, M times G of the person plus, uh, now this is going to be rho of air area times the height, and I did not make the height of the air in the drawing, so I go back there so we can have an aha moment over there. All right. <coughs> And then this is divided by area, and the weight also has g. So we have this term. Oh, I have to divide by a there also. mg divided by a plus rho g h. And this is rho of the air. So we see that a column of a fluid. Air is a fluid. A column of a fluid. Water is a fluid. Those two, if there's a column, will contribute to pressure because you have to hold them under gravity. And we see then that the pressure change is rho gh. If we start somewhere, and move up in elevation or altitude, the pressure will change by rho times g times how high we went. If we go down, the pressure will get bigger. So let's look at, uh, oh, you're probably thinking, damn, now there are equations. So. Let's look at a dam. Here's a dam. And over here is the water and a seagull. And over here is the ground. And on this side is air. Both sides of the dam have some kind of fluid pushing against the walls. On the left side, there's some air. And on the right side, there's water. <clears throat> if you go up and down on the air side of the dam, do you think of there as being much pressure difference? I brought, <laughs> students are so nice, they leave things in classrooms and I don't have to buy anything. So this is a Hoover Dam thermos, and it has electric generator pictures on it. Oh, be still my beating heart. <laughs> so on Hoover Dam, you know, it's a long ways down on one side because the air, right? It's not so far down on the side full of water. You could jump there probably, but then it would not work too well. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> the air side, you don't think about the pressure difference between here and here much. But if you were to dive in and swim down, what happens to your ears as you go to the bottom of a swimming pool? You notice the pressure increase, right? 
Water has a density that's about, not quite, a thousand times more than air. So a column of water is going to have almost a thousand times the weight of a similar column of air per square meter on the bottom. So if we start here, and let's have this be y equals zero up here at the surface of the water, and I'm going to make positive distance go downward. Now that may bother you for some reason, but try to pick your coordinates and your origins for convenient purposes. So for example, you are, you're Amy. Amy. Oh, I already has acquaintance with you, right? And you are? Vanessa. Vanessa. Hi, I'm Roger McWilliams. Do you think of yourself as the center of the world? The answer is yes. You're supposed to say yes. Okay, yes. Okay, so Vanessa is gracious enough to agree that she thinks of herself as the center of the world. So you have a Vanessa-centric coordinate system, right? Show me your coordinate system. Okay, so everybody does this, right? You have a coordinate system, and that's x equal y equal z equal zero, right? Yeah. And you get to pick where the power center is. That's up to you. Okay, but everybody likes to have a coordinate system and pick it. And Vanessa's is not the same as Amy's. It's translated by about 1.5 meters right now, isn't it? And a little bit 10 centimeter lower. Both of those coordinate systems are fine to use. What you do when you face a physics problem is pick the coordinate system that will be most beneficial for your purposes. So if you're starting to hear those little voices of nature, it will help you pick the coordinate system, and then you don't get obscured by mathematics. I hate math. I do not like mathematics. But I have to do it. I have to do it a lot, okay? So I like physics. Oh, darn, I have to speak a language. Oh, math, okay. So, like, you know, I did like six, seven years of calculus, that kind of stuff. Took it from mathematicians and applied mathematicians and scientists and, okay, you get used to it. So, you want to pick your math to make it as easy as possible. What happens here? What's the voice tell you? As you go down here, what happens to the pressure? It increases. Right? So I want to find the pressure increase as I go down, and I'd love to start from here. What's the pressure at those lapping waves height? What is the pressure? One would say zero, and one would also say one atmosphere. Both are correct. That's an example of picking the coordinate system that's convenient. We're picking a pressure coordinate system that's convenient. The air pressure is one atmosphere there for a typical dam. I know that. And when I read the pressure on a gauge, I don't need it to tell me it's one atmosphere. I need it to tell me how much more or less than one atmosphere it is. So I will typically have a gauge that says zero. But in my brain, I know it's one atmosphere. Okay? We can use either of those. I'm going to choose to use zero here and calculate the change in pressure due to the water. We'll put the air aside, right? It's not that it went away, we're just not considering that in the problem. And so if we go down here to some distance, some distance y, and we look at our dam over here, what is the pressure here? And the pressure at y, due to the water is going to be rho of the water, g, times the change in y, right? So that's going to be rho g times y for the coordinate system that I picked, because I picked a positive downward y. If I'd pick to have my coordinate system pointing up, the physics is the same but I would get that the pressure was negative because I'd have a minus y going on there. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that minus sign. The pressure is not negative. It just tells you that there was an increase or decrease and that sign tells you which way to consider. So this is the change in pressure from y equals zero to, oh, I went to some 
position, right, is given by that. Okay, so now, here's the thing. Notice I made the dam a little bit thicker at the bottom than at the top. There are a couple of reasons to do that. When you pile stuff, it will tend to spread to meet the angle of repose of the material, the coefficient of static friction of the material. So if you're building an earth-filled dam, you need to build it with that in mind. Now, if you build it with cement and concrete, you can make it a steeper angle. The second reason you do it is the pressure at the bottom is much higher than the pressure at the top. So it's like, uh, <coughs> Josh. Josh, can you stand up for a second? OK, here we go. I'm Roger McWilliams, hi. If I push up here on Josh, I can exert a torque, can't I? And it would tend to tip him over. Now this one is strange. The water at the top is pushing sideways here. Here's the, the water level, right? But the water at the bottom is also pushing sideways, much stronger. So you would feel a sideways torque up here with the lever arm down to his feet. That's a pretty strong lever arm. It doesn't take as much force to push him over up here, right? But there would also be a very strong, much stronger sideways force at the bottom. So if we want to figure the total force pushing Josh towards Arnold towards Arles, that's a famous city. And then there's a, a sideways force there that's very strong, and it's stronger at the bottom. So the dam, you have a seat, Josh, thanks. The, the dam needs to be protected from breaking and then spilling all the water out, causing whatever calamity is associated with that. So if we asked ourselves, what is the total force on the dam sideways? You have to add it up from the bottom to the top for the water. And it's not the same at the bottom. This F sideways is a function of height. So if you want to figure out the total force on the dam, uh-oh, uh-oh. F total sideways is going to be the integral of the little dfs from y equals 0 to y equals y. And you have to add them up. You have to do the math. There is an example in your book which does that. The example in the book does not do it for the side with the air. It just calculates it for the water. Why? This is the thinking simple part of doing physics. First off, the air is 1,000 times less dense than the water. That force from the air across that dam, other than the one atmosphere pressure, the difference in the force on the dam side is going to be a thousand times less than what the water is doing. If I'm not worried about 10% effects, I'm surely not going to worry about 0.1% effects. Okay? <clears throat> Secondly, the change in pressure across there, from the top of the dam to the bottom of the dam, the change in pressure for the air side is negligible. There isn't much weight supported in the air in the atmosphere that way, in the difference between the top and bottom of the dam. The change in pressure is small. You don't have to do this integral for the air pressure side. You can just take one atmosphere and multiply by the entire side of the dam area, and you get the answer for the air side. You can't do that for the water side. You have to do the integral. The physics tells you where you can skip the steps or where you have to do them. Mm. OK, let's see now.
Shall we get some motion? Get a little motion going? Um, let's see. Ah, see, sir, have you helped yet? No. Would you care to join me up front? Sure. Okay, bring your paper. We're going to destroy it. And you are? Jose. Jose. Good to meet you. Um, I'm going to take uh, some of this paper. Is that okay? All right. All right. Now, let's work together on this. Everybody else, I want you guys to get something from somewhere near you and do the same thing. Tear off a two centimeter wide strip along the paper. So match that, okay? Just two centimeter wide strip across the paper. Jose can supply a few if you really can't find somebody friendly near you. Okay, we're getting there. Two centimeters wide. There's a lot of ways to do it. Some people will be very neat and do a fold and then that, that really makes it a little easier to get it carefully done, doesn't it? All right? Some people will just tear it and it's gonna be whatever, okay? Now, <clears throat> I showed you one to start with just to help you with that two centimeter wide kind of initial estimate thing, right? Okay, do we have the paper? Okay, there's an old Marx Brother line that I need to use now. Show me your tongs. You're not. Show me your tongs. And then they rush out and grab hold. Tong. Right? I speak with forked tongue. Okay. Now, I want you to do this. Getting close. <laughs> the, hold it against your lower lip and just blow across the top with your, your the fingers separated. It makes a little dizziness, doesn't it? Come on, I want to see it. You can't do it on your telephone. Do it. Get a piece of paper and do it. This is a participatory class. If you don't have it torn, borrow it from that guy. He's very friendly. Show her how to do it. She, she wants to learn how to do it. Yeah, now show her and let her do it. Hand her the paper, turn around, get friendly. God, it's, all, it's a human being, it's okay. <laughs> They're not gonna bite. Okay, now, tell your parents what you learned in physics. Okay, what did we learn? No, no, this is now, oh, serious, we're gonna write equations, aren't we? Oh, yes, yes. What is the mass of this piece of paper? Approximately. What did we learn yesterday? What was this mass here? One gram. Doesn't that kind of get close to one gram, right? Something, it's about the same thickness. It's a little bit different. It's actually a little under a gram. Did you make it work? Or did you get too dizzy? Yeah. <laughs> It does get you lightheaded, doesn't it? Okay, something to do with that oxidation process. Okay, so it's about a gram. What happened to the paper when you blew across the top? It lifted. Whoa! I thought gravity was holding it down. It lifted. But it got lifted out here. I'm not holding it there. I'm holding it at this end. It got lifted out there. The force is with us. <laughs> and the force was enough to lift one gram way out there away from my fingers, wasn't it? What happened? Here's this thing hanging down. Jose, did you make it work? Yes. You want to demonstrate? 
Yes. <laughs> and if you do it here, it's a lot easier. Okay? It's, it's years of practice. You can get a PhD in blowing paper. You get, that's good. Now, now, when you watch, when Jose is blowing, what else do you see? It lifted, yes, and it did a, an, an oscillation. That is, isn't that a neat word? That one's just a bizarre word. Okay, did you say it? Mm -hmm. It's flapping around, it's oscillating, and it's like it's unstable, right? What do you see on that dam picture? The water. What do you see on the water? The way I drew the water. You okay, Jose? Stop blowing. You'll you'll pass you'll pass out in a second. So, what do you see on the water? Waves. What makes waves? Wind. Wind makes waves. The distance over open water that the wind travels is called the fetch. Fetch. F-E-T-C-H. Tell the dog, go fetch. You're telling the dog to go that distance over an open field. The distance of air traveling over water making the waves is called the fetch. So try this at home. Get in the bathtub. Put a fan on one side. And watch. Near the fan, the waves are very small. Further away from the fan, where it's had some time to travel across the water, the waves get larger. The motion of one fluid across something else did some force transfer there, did some friction, but it also made a change in pressure, didn't it? The pressure here on this side of the paper is one atmosphere, the pressure here is one atmosphere, and then I blow across it. Well, the pressure down below, there's no air blowing underneath, but there's air blowing across the top. And the pressure changed. The movement of the air, the flowing of the air, caused the pressure above to be less. It lifted the paper. Your observation is moving air lowers the pressure. That's your observation from this. And you can tell me about how much because you know it picked up one gram of paper and you know what the surface area is and you also know how fast you were blowing, don't you? And you go, oh no, wait, wait, wait. I don't know that, do I? Yes, sir? So when you're blowing air under the piece of paper, you're, you're creating low pressure on the bottom? If I blow under, now I'll do that in just a second. I'm blowing over right now. Right and it picked the paper up. And then it caused that oscillation, an instability, right? That instability, it's flipping back and forth like this. When it comes up, the piece of paper is blocking the airflow a little bit and gets hit. And there's a momentum kick to push it back down. And then it gets kicked down, and then the pressure reduction, then the air gets flowing again across the top of it, picks it up, kicks it, knocks it back down. Oh, that sounds like a clarinet or a saxophone, doesn't it? Now we can be musicians. Okay. Now, if we blow underneath, where's the paper right now? It's just hanging down, right? On the bottom, if I blow, it picked it up also, didn't it? So, oh, Jose, yes. let's be airplanes. <laughs> this is so fun. Okay, now we're going to take off. What do we want our wings to do to take off? Yeah, you want the air to flow above them, but you also want the wings tipped upward a little in the front so that the air as we go to take off, <laughs> what's happening? Okay, as you're coming this way, Tip, tip the air, and here's an air molecule and it goes bang on the wing and gets knocked down, doesn't it? What does that do to the wing? Right? Lifts, lifts, lifts. 
So airplanes fly by a momentum exchange hitting the bottom of the wing, knocking air molecules down. That's how they fly. I don't care if anybody taught you they fly according to Bernoulli's equation, but I do care that you know how planes actually fly, and you cannot use Bernoulli's equation to make that prediction. <laughs> okay? It's not wrong, but you can't use it for that. So, <clears throat> we need to figure momentum exchange on the bottom of the wing. There's a little bit of pressure differential across the, uh, the wing as well. But that force, it's the forward force. If the airplane comes to a halt, even though the wings are tipped, what happens? You crash. Okay? Unless you're already on the ground. Okay. All right, thank you, Jose. We're good for that. Okay, so now we've got good. This is an excellent demonstration, right? You're going to make a great pilot for young children later. You'll really do a good job with them. They'll like that, okay? Okay? Now, you guys should practice that at home, too, okay? Find a little kid and show them about physics, okay? So now we've learned that blowing air across the top of a piece of paper can lift it which means the pressure is lower, but you didn't tell me that you knew how fast the air was blowing. Oh, look at this. We go. <laughs> how fast is the air blowing? Okay, about one meter a second coming out, right? Maybe two or three meters a second coming out. I didn't spit. It's okay. <laughs> All right. When I was in junior high, we put some tacks on the teacher's seat up front, and he sat on them and didn't make a single sound. Never even noticed he was sitting on these tacks. Oh, man. <laughs> we nicknamed him Old Iron Butt. <laughs> okay, so... A couple meters a second is what the air is blowing across the top, and it lifted the paper. And it also caused an instability. It tended to mix things up. So let's see what we can get from this. Okay. We get pressure, the air pressure. We have, oh, let's take a little chunk of something here. So a little mass element. Okay, so it has a mass like that, some little mass element there. And I'm going to move it up, raise it. with gravity down. And what, what, what's the, uh, the change in potential energy is mg times that change in height, right? Change in height. So that's going to be, um, we're going to have a little dmg and this uh, delta y. Okay, so we have the potential energy. The potential energy. Uh, now, we got to pick a coordinate system, don't we? We get to pick the coordinate system. And potential energy has no for sure zero point. We get to pick it. We get to pick where the zero point is. So we're going to say that's going to be <coughs> mgy because we picked the coordinate system. We picked the uh, Amy-centric coordinate system or the Vanessa-centric coordinate system. Okay, so if we thought of for our volume, for our little volume, the U, the potential energy per volume then is going to be rho times V G, Y over V. Oh, can't do that one. <clears throat> so 
So the change in potential energy per volume is going to be rho g y. I take a little chunk of something that has a volume equal to 1, whatever 1 cubic centimeter, 1 cubic meter we pick which volume we're thinking about. The change in potential energy per unit volume is the density times g times however high we lift it or take it back down in gravity. Oh, okay. All we did was take potential energy and do it per volume. How about considering kinetic energy? Consider. What does consider mean? To take into account. To take into account. How can we tell what that word means? What is the con part? Con means with, right? And sitter, where does that come from? From Sid. From Sid, yes, and I know somebody named that, actually. Uh, siderare, right? The Latin, to regard, to look. So with looking, to consider, to, how did you say it? You had a good definition. Uh, Okay, that's good enough. Consider kinetic energy. Okay, if we want to consider kinetic energy density, we could go kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. And v, in this case, we're thinking about the, the speed. And if I want to think of kinetic energy per unit volume, I divide by the volume. Now I have two v's in that equation, don't I? I've got a little v for speed squared, and I've got a big v for the volume you really need to keep track of things conceptually in physics, not mathematically, but conceptually, so that your equations talk to you. And what we are left with then is the big picture v's go away, and we're left with a half rho v squared. The speed squared is the kinetic energy density of a fluid. Yes, sir? When you do a per volume, why do you multiply the top? Oh, why did I do, because m equals rho times v, and all I did was replace m with that alternative way of saying what it was. These considerations apply for materials with constant densities, incompressible. They cannot be compressed and the density is uniform throughout the material. Why I do that is two reasons. One, it makes the conceptual side easier. Two, there are a lot of fluids in life that are basically incompressible for a lot of what we do. So you have to ask yourself, is the incompressible approximation reasonable? And if it is, you go ahead and use it. And if it's not, you ask, how do I need to alter it? Just like Hooke's law for springs, right? F equals kx minus kx, okay? And we could take an arm, put it on a table, and I can push sideways and bend the bone a little bit, and it responds with the F equals kx. And you're happy with the Hooke's law to a point. And if I push too hard, you will object <laughs> because you know the Hooke's Law response will not apply. And it's not that the equation was wrong, it just no longer applied to the model and you then have a broken arm or I have bad news because <laughs> you're probably stronger than me, right? <laughs> so, okay, no, you probably are stronger than me, but remember, old age and treachery will overcome youth and enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I have the resources and you're trying to take them away. <laughs> okay? 
that's okay. So there's a lot of different things you can bring to the table. Okay. So now what we notice, if we are thinking about energy conservation, we go up the hill. If we rolled the ball up the hill, what happens to it as it goes up the hill? It slows down. It changes the kinetic energy of motion into the potential energy. And what we do here microscopically is say the same thing. We say the pressure at some point, say plus And all I have said here is that we're conserving energy. And all I've said is, let's think about it from a microscopic point of view instead of macroscopic. It's still rolling balls up and down hills. But we're thinking about it per unit volume or force per unit area. That's cool. That has some predictive capability. So when we blow across the top, we're not changing the height. The paper is right there. We are changing the speed. The speed of the air underneath the paper is about what? Zero. The speed of the uh, air across the top of the paper is about one to three meters per second, somewhere in that range. So the pressure difference bottom to top must be a half rho v squared prediction, right? <clears throat> uh, OK, so for the paper, how do we draw a person? That looks like about, you know, North and South Carolina. <laughs> Where does the eye go? Okay, so I guess the eye has to go here, doesn't it? Okay. All right, so the paper is blowing across like that with a little bit, and here is V of the air blown, V above. And V below is about zero. <clears throat> y1 equals Y2. So we're saying that P1 plus a half rho V1 squared equals P2. That's what we're saying. Delta P. Is a half rho v squared. Let's do a calculation. To develop, <clears throat> do we think this is a very big change in pressure? What's your gut reaction? No, it's not. We're not picking up, we're not blowing across the top of the bottle and picking it up. We're just picking up a little bit of paper. Okay. Okay, delta P is about one half. What's rho? For air, 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter times V. Let's use two meters per second squared. So, one half, 1.3, four. 2.6, and the units are newtons per square meter. And the, uh, 
pressure to compare. Compare. Build your intuition. One atmosphere is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth newtons per square meter. A hundred thousand, fifty thousand times, forty thousand times more. It doesn't take much pressure. Now remember I said for physics we want to learn to do it where we look at it from different perspectives. So I'm over at the chalkboard, now I'm in a different perspective, I'm over here. Well how much force was needed to pick up the piece of paper? mg of the paper, right? Consi you know, for a different perspective, ponder. Ponder that the m of the paper times g was 1 gram, 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, times 9.8. So that's nine, <coughs> that's about 10 to the minus two newtons. That's all we needed. The force from the pressure is going to be the pressure times the area, and that's 2.6 newtons per square meter, and the area is about two centimeters. 10 to the minus 2 by 10 centimeters long. Uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. <clears throat> so it needed a little less than the lifting force. The lifting force was a little greater than needed to lift mg. And wasn't it shaking the paper pretty good? So there was a little extra. And all of this number stuff, the predictive capability works. Oh, cool. Let's do some more demonstration stuff. Let nature talk to us a little more. Now, Jose, we could bring you down and have you do this, or I can just use an electric motor to make an airflow. Which do you think is better? The airflow. Electricity. Oh, thank you very much for electricity. Okay. Watts that, you said? Okay, so now, what do I have here? A ball. Right? A little ball. What do we have going on here? Is it being held in the air? Yes. yes. There's nothing. Right? I don't have any. There's nothing up here either. <laughs> okay? This is not a television show trying to fake you out about stuff and then pretending it's very real and exciting. This is, in fact, about as dull as it gets. <laughs> it's pulling that thing up. You're pushing it up. So there's air. <laughs> the momentum exchange on the bottom. There's a DPDT against the MG pulling it down. The ball is very light, isn't it? It's about one gram, probably. It's very light. I don't use a steel ball for this. But it's also not going to the right or the left and going away, is it? So what happens? If the ball starts to move a little to the right or the left, now there's air going by that side a little preferentially compared to the other, a little faster on that side compared to the other. So if it starts to move away, the air that's coming towards the center above here is moving faster than the air that's further out. What did it do to the paper when we blew it? the faster air sucked the paper towards it, didn't it? So if the ball starts to move away, 
the faster column of air in the middle starts to pull it back. So there's a come hither force from the pressure differential and there's a holding up force from the momentum exchange. What a magic thing delivered. Oh, there was somebody said magic. There's the one moment of magic, right? Now, let's see. I'm going to tip this thing and see what happens. I'm going to rotate it. So now it's not directly above. Can you see what the angle is? And it's at an angle of about 15 degrees, then it finally fell off, right? So it was able to hold it and keep pulling it back up to about 15 degrees. Okay, let's see what this guy does. I'm not thrilled by that. Okay, oh, let's, let's take a look at, at this now. Now, I don't want anybody ever to have said again that it was not true that their education was watered down. We are watering it down right now. Oh, who would like to help? Volunteer. Okay, come on up. Pour the water in the tube. Do that. Uh, <laughs> it's not hard, is it? <laughs> and you are, what's it? What's your name? Harry. Okay, Harry, turn so smile to the class, you know. Oh. It's your, you know, part of your 14 minutes or whatever. Okay. Keep going, keep going, um, keep going. We're going to go to about there. Okay, stop. Cool. Set that down. <clears throat> Let's pull this out just so there's no confusion about things. Okay, so you're Harry? Yes. Okay. So this is Harry, bar none. Okay. You don't know? Okay, they don't get that one. Okay. We'll talk later. <laughs> okay, so now, what do you see here, here, and here? Three, three uh, I guess, holes there are caps. Three holes that... I guess are plugged. Plugged. In fact, we put a cork in it. Yeah. Now, Harry, what you're going to do, not till I say, but what you're going to do is pull those three corks out almost simultaneously. Okay. Use all three hands. I... And <clears throat> I suppose you could by, with the teeth on one of them, but we don't have to get fancy. Okay, so column of water. Is the pressure the same at the top? Pressure gets higher or lower as we go down? Higher as we go down. What is the separation between the corks? Three, nine centimeters, ten centimeters? He's saying ten centimeters, say, approximately, right? Okay. If the pressure is getting higher as we go down, and we're thinking about pressure and kinetic energy, the pressure outside is one atmosphere, right? But the pressure inside gets bigger and bigger, so there's more motive force to create a bigger V squared. So we expect, in our minds, higher pressure will have a stronger squirt. And the stronger squirt will be towards the bottom. When Harry pulls the plug, on this, not me, <laughs> when Harry pulls the plug, you're going to measure how far the water goes. Harry? Yes. This is Sally. Okay. She's going to give you notes so that you can get the measurements, okay? Okay. Okay? Meet her at the cafe later. Sure. Okay. So, now, are we ready? You're going to do the measurements? No, we're doing the measurements, guys. That's what we're doing. Okay. Ready? You want to help me out with one? No. No, I want to watch. Oh. I want, this is Harry's demo. Go, these. ready? Go for it. Plug them back up if you still got the corks. Did excellent cork pulling. You may get a little wet on that bottom one. Should we try it again? Because science should be reproducible, right? I have two children. <laughs> okay. 
You ready? Yeah. Okay, fill her up. Did you get some idea? What was the shape of the, of the water stream? The shape of the water stream was an arc, roughly, what kind of mathematical shape? Parabola. Okay, guys, try this later today in the bathroom. Take a look. It's a parabola. Okay? <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, come on. It's fluid physics, right? I'm doing experiments. Okay, ready? Get the measurements, how far it goes out here, right? Let's, let's say, uh, why don't you measure how far it goes out at this height, the bottom, the base of this thing, okay? Measure how far out it goes and get your measurements there. Sally, you're gonna get them? I don't know what your name is, but we'll just call you Sally for this lecture. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Look at that. The one at the bottom actually got the farthest out, didn't it? So Harry, you're excellent at pulling the plug. Okay? If you're volunteering in a hospital somewhere, don't follow that direction unless it's real clear it's supposed to be, okay? Because okay. it's not like this, okay? All right, that was, the excitement was unbelievable for that. We have another demonstration to do, okay? Now you should be able then to tell me what is the kinetic energy. Oh, let's see, parabolic motion, it got out this far in this much drop. I know what Vy was initially. Oh. I'm seeing a lot of sinking stomachs, right? You can tell me what the initial kinetic energy was. You can tell me what the initial V is to make a prediction against what the pressure differential was. Harry, have a seat. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, all right. Cool. Okay. Who would? Let's see. We need. We did a. We did a guy. We need to do a gal. Have either of you gals helped? No, okay, Yen, who, you point at who's going to volunteer. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Come on up. Hi. Hi, I'm Tiffany. Tiffany, I'm Roger McWilliams. Hi. Come on down. It's safe down here, okay? So now, Tiffany, there you go. What do you have in your hand? Um, Come on around here, smile, describe to the happy crowd. Um, plastic golf balls? Plastic golf balls. A completely useless object, right? And now we're going to take those plastic golf balls and we're going to make them levitate somehow. Let's see if we can do it there. Okay. What do you see? Plastic tube. A bigger tube, a smaller tube, a bigger tube. We'll do a drawing in a second on the board if you can't quite figure for yourself. Okay. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Balance the balls there. And you can let go and it should stay. Let me try one, two. Oh, they don't want to do it. Okay. More force. Always use a bigger hammer. Uh, uh, Tiffany, yeah. right? Okay, so now Tiffany has placed these three golf balls. Were they the same weight? Um, yeah? yeah? Okay, why don't you just reverse to the middle one with one on the outside. Oh, look, we see a little bouncing action for a second, right? So the upward force is balanced against gravity pulling down. A little bit of overshoot, a little bit of spring stuff there. But now in the middle, the one in the middle, is it as high above the tubes as the ones on the outside? No, it's not. But the air is blowing in from one end. The drawing looks something like, you'll be okay, Tiffany, hang on. The drawing looks something like tube, tube, like that. Is it closed on that end? 
no. There's a, well, there's a little hole, right, to let some air out, but not much. And on this end, it's the, the vacuum or the air supply, right? What do we know about the pressure? There's enough pressure here to lift the ball that high. There's enough pressure over here to lift the ball the same height. In the middle, the pressure is not able to lift it as high, is it? So the pressure in the middle is lower than the pressure at the two other sides. Okay, uh, I can't think of anything more exciting to do with that. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Great job. <clears throat> okay, so you should be able to notice then, if we put air in here, it had to come out one of those three holes or the end over here, right? Had to go out. Air in equals air out. Just like when we drink water in equals water out, right? So the air is conserved going through there. And are we all at the same height? There's no change in potential energy, right? So if the amount of air going in we could say the amount of air, what do we need to do to this? Do we need to add an additional area, area factor to that? A1 rho V1, A2 rho V2. That's the conservation of air or the conservation of water or whatever we want to conserve. So, this is just saying the mass in equals the mass out. So, so long as there's no compression, what we know here, all the mass is carried through a big tube, then all the mass is carried through a small tube. It has to go faster here, doesn't it? The speed must be faster in the small tube. If the speed is faster, then the pressure is lower in that tube area. So you should be able to say what it's going to be for that. Okay, see you guys tomorrow morning.